Good morning. We're going to get our meeting started. Um, I'll start by introducing the councillors. So we have First District Councillor Carney, Council President Helen Hudson, Councillor at Large Steve Thompson. I am Councillor at Large Michael Green and Fifth District Councillor Joe Driscoll. Um, so at this time, why don't we turn it over to you guys and you can explain, introduce yourself and then explain what we got. Great. Okay. Uh, hi, Councillors. Chris Daly, I'm the Director of Administration um, and I have with me Neil Burke with DPW. Um, and Evan will be joining us in a moment who helps with our accountability program. Uh, a few documents in front of you guys. Uh, we're going to start today with just a background and overview, talk through the proposed uh, agreement for the sidewalk snow removal pilot program, talk about some of the alternatives that we considered, discuss next steps, and then answer any questions. Okay. So I want to thank you guys all again for the opportunity to present this information and talk about the Supplemental Sidewalk Snow Removal Program. Goal for today is just to make sure that you guys have all the information um, that you need to make an informed uh, decision on a legislative item, which would allow the city to enter into agreement for this service. Um, we'll be able to answer many questions throughout, uh, throughout this session. We have a few different people, including our legal team, who will be here to help uh, support and answer any additional questions that the three of us can answer. Um, so from day one, as you guys all know, we come back to our objectives. Our objective has been to deliver city services effectively, efficiently, and equitably. Um, it's one of our most important duties, and we truly believe that this is an essential step in helping to achieve that. This particular issue of clearing the sidewalks, we also believe, is a matter of public safety for our citizens. Each year, people's lives are at risk walking in the streets because the sidewalks are not clear. While it's ultimately the responsibility of home and business owners to clear the sidewalks, we also recognize this to be a community-wide challenge, which is why we want to pilot this supplemental program. Um, I can't stress enough <laughs> that this is a pilot program and it's a supplemental service. Um, we have learned a lot in this process um, and we will continue to learn a lot as we move forward and we appreciate you uh, coming along with us for the, the journey and learning throughout. Um, getting council approval is the first step in a longer process to help us improve our neighborhoods, deliver quality services, um, and, and moving this forward will help us do that. So with that overview, I'll stop by providing a background of the Supplemental Sidewalk Snow Removal Pilot Program, which is such a mouthful to say. Uh, I'll then provide some information on the legislation, which would allow us to enter into the agreement for the contracted services. And then after that, we'll talk about some alternatives and just how we came to the decision um, to ask council to help us consider and move forward down this path. Um, I'm going to try to answer and address any questions that you guys have that I could anticipate throughout the presentation, but I will also make sure that we have time at the end to answer any additional questions. Um, and you also have a few things in front of you that I just want to make sure that we reference. You have a brief agenda and fact sheet that I'll refer to a couple of times. It includes a lot of these highlights. Um, it also includes, your packet includes a scope of the program that has route descriptions as well as information on the contractor in it. Um, and then certain information regarding to this, uh, regarding uh, the program is also proprietary. So in the event that we have questions about that, we will move to executive session at that point. Um, any questions before we jump into the remainder? Okay. Um, so a little bit of background. So several months ago, the administration presented information to the council on the supplemental sidewalk, supplemental sidewalk snow removal pilot program. <laughs> Um, that presentation was just meant to give an introduction to the pilot program uh, before we released the RFP and began the negotiations with the contractor, and then also wanting to make sure that the council and the community understood the pilot program scope and goals. Um, I'll provide a brief overview of what was in that presentation and then point out some areas that have changed since that original discussion to where we are in the contract now. Um, I also just want to reiterate, because this is a pilot, we will be fully reevaluating reevaluating each component of this at the end of the season to determine how this worked and what we would want to change uh, moving forward. And as I already said, this has been a learning process for us, and I think there's a lot of learning we've done along the way that will apply moving forward. Um, if you look on your agenda, you see some of the highlights of the scope and cost of the program. A few areas to point out. So first thing to note is that the deployment threshold has changed. It's now three inches of actual snow accumulation on the ground, rather than a certain amount of snow per precipitation in a given 24 hour period. So we made this change because we recognize that deploying based on precipitation could lead to situations in which slow continuous snow um, led to a dangerous amount of snow, but never actually 
triggered a deployment. So for example, it could snow two inches a day for five days straight, and that would leave us with a substantial amount of slow that would ne snow that would never um, be cleared under our contract stipulation. Under the new model, <clears throat> there will be a deployment whenever there is three inches of snow on the ground, regardless of the day of the precipitation. A second change from the RFP is that the program is not going to include salting this year, which was a, a component that we did include in the RFP. Um, a couple of things that we learned on this front. Um, first, the original RFP required um, pet-friendly salt. And what we found out is that that is substantially more expensive than regular salt. Um, it, you know, it was of particular importance to many of the citizens who contacted us, and so that's why we wanted to include it in the RFP originally. But in our engagement with contractors since, um, what we found out is that it was a substantial barrier to people applying. And I hear what you're saying, but can I ask you a question? Because I know when you move the snow without the salt, it becomes very slippery. So what type of liability are we going to hold on that? Um, from a liability standpoint, I I think we need to turn it over to council. Kristen? They were just, no, they were just asking what would liability be? If the, if the prospect is to remove the snow without salt, perhaps it could get slippery, what would be the city's liability in that situation? Well, if you come to the mic, we, sorry, just the protocol. She would know the answer to that. If we could, I think it would be better if we could um, leave the legal questions to an executive session at the end. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. Uh, just on that, what's the, the the policy that we have, or that we're? I mean, I, my assumption is, is that we're trying to be you know, make sure the city's indemnified of any. What's what's the policy? Like, what's the amount? Is it you know, is it a million, three million? Do you know? Uh, I don't. I mean, I think that's another okay. legal question. Um, so on the salt front, so even non-pet friendly salt raises the cost of services in a way that isn't manageable within our budget for this season, um, and existing city sidewalk removal doesn't include salting, so the change is sort of maintaining an existing standard while we test the pilot program. Um, the minimum 42 inch clearance on sidewalks has not changed since the original uh, presentation in the RFP, That's, that remains the same, um, and the equipment requirements have not changed since the original RFP. Uh, the program will be completed by tractors equipped with sidewalk plows and rear snow blowers. Um, v plows are not permitted except to clear approaches in heavy snow conditions. Uh, the routes have not changed in your packet. They're outlined and they remain the, the same as originally discussed. Um, I think that covers everything within the RFP. So from there, we can talk about the proposed agreement. So we're asking for authorization to enter into contract with a company called JSK Snow Services Incorporated. Um, there is information in your packet on JSK specifically. Um, we can also answer additional questions if you have them. Um, we have been working closely with JSK to arrive at an agreement in principle, which both parties would intend to formalize if the council approves. Um, they came to our attention through referral and recommendation from the downtown committee, and they currently perform this service. Um, they do sidewalk snow removal, uh, maintaining approximately seven miles of sidewalk at Electronics Business Park. Um, they do service those sidewalks 10 to 12 times in a 24-hour period during active snowfall, um, and they maintain, they maintain a snow-free surface from that standpoint. Uh, JSK has been in the sidewalk snow removal business for four years and has been in the snow management business for many years beyond that. Um, they have the capacity to take on this work. They currently have nine employees and intend to initially bring on an additional two employees for the project. Um, and we have discussed with them uh, hiring from within the city, and they're very open to that. Um, and the administration will help to facilitate that so that they can find the qualified candidates they need from within the community. Um, the proposed agreement is for one year. Um, it is starting on or before February 1st, which uh, allows the city to have the maximum flexibility in deciding how to proceed after the pilot. Um, the agreement also includes performance review condition evaluations and termination rights to ensure that the city and its residents are protected. Uh, the agreement is not to exceed the amount of $170,000 with the contract being paid on a per deployment basis. 
The city will also reimburse for the cost of additional insurance to the program not to exceed $15,000. This amount is included in the overall not to exceed $170,000, so that is inclusive of the $15,000 for the insurance. Um, Happy to ad address additional questions about contract specifics. I believe that that would be done in executive session. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I, my question was just going to be with the, the 170 that we're paying them. I, I know there were previous discussions with last contract of maybe having an, uh, have them on call. Mm -hmm. um, are, it, we're just strictly paying them for each time that they actually go out. There's no that's correct. on call. There's no upfront. We're just when they go out for deployment. That's that's okay. Correct. Not to exceed 170 thousand per deployment. Okay. Is, is there somebody here from the company? Uh, they are not here with us today. We had intended to have them, but with the snow over the weekend, they are fully staffed and not working, but they can be available to answer questions. Okay, and you said that the, the contract is for one year, uh, which would bring it, if we signed it, uh, or if it were okay, it would be from February to January? Um, actually, that's, I don't know the answer to that. It would be only for the season, so it would be from February until April. Yeah. Okay, for, for yeah. the season, so not for a year. Right. Yes, sir. yes. So the point being um, that when we get to the end of this season, we we want to yeah, debrief yeah. and talk that's about. That's why when you yes. said a year, right? Yep. Was, yeah. yeah. Sorry for the confusion there. Did I miss here? Did you mention hiring from within the community? Yes, right. that's correct. So they would. So could you go through yeah. that for me? For so me? they intend to bring on two additional staff to help facilitate this work, and they have agreed to work with the administration mm -hmm. to um, figure out the, the best people um, and just facilitate the hiring process from within. We know that there are qualified candidates in the city, and we'll make sure to help those candidates find the opportunity. So to piggyback, it would just be seasonal for the people in, that they hire? Uh, I am not positive um, what their decision will be, so and I don't have a sense of whether or not um, I, I know that they do year-round work. So, but I'm not positive what they'll decide to do um, as a business. So the obvious question is, if they they can't be here because they're out there plowing today, which makes sense, how are they going to do the city streets um, with the? equipment and stuff that they have on hand now um they are oh executives yes no I'm a, I'm a little uh so they are um purchasing additional equipment um which will service the city sidewalks and they are intending to hire additional staff as well they said they would purchase more equipment yes yep i don't know if you want to they have arranged to purchase additional equipment if this is approved by the council they've already spoken with their vendors to make sure that it's available it is available. Um, so I'll also note that the contractor has uh, already provided as a sign of good faith in the negotiations and intent uh, to enter into a contract with the city uh, a certified check for the bonding requirements um, required by the city. So that has already taken place. Um, the bonding requirements protect the city from unexpected costs. So uh, we have that as sort of a safety policy, and it's returned after the agreement, assuming that there aren't any reasons to, to need that bonded um, money. Wait, can you, can you go further into that? So there's that's like a ad hoc insurance policy? Yeah, it's, an, it's a bonding requirement that the city has so that if something were to happen that's unexpected, we have that sort of uh, as an assurance that you know, we can cover those things and it's just we hold it if um, there aren't any issues or no you know, no need to use it it is returned at the end of the contract period um, but again I think that's a, a show of good faith that they are committed partners to, to do this work with us um, and intend to be good partners to us as we move forward Um, I do want to talk about a couple of alternatives that we considered as we worked through this process just to cover that um, we did consider limiting the routes, and we did consider using internal resources to complete the work. Um, while limiting the routes may have made it easier in the short term to begin the work, uh, we wouldn't have gotten as. That's right. Uh, we would not have gotten as much valuable data um, that will be vital in making the decision on how to run this program moving forward. Um, it also, while we have more control over internal resources. Um, you know, as we've talked about, this is a pilot program, and so the idea of making a significant capital outlay on equipment um, 
would really transition that from being a pilot program to being something that we undertake as a city moving forward, um, because you can't really move those capital assets quickly. So the idea of making sure that we can be flexible, the city can be flexible in how we make this decision moving forward, um, was really why we continued to choose to pursue um, the, the outside contract. Um, we do feel like that's the best solution for this season. But as we've talked about, I think the point of this season is really to learn how um, this can be done best so that we can um, identify next year whether or not that is the right approach for us moving forward. So another question. I don't know what's executive session and what's not. So if you have it is, just tell me. Um, so we couldn't do this after this season like we do the summer help. We wouldn't be able to do that as a city. I'm sorry. I don't. I'm, could you clarify? Like, do you know how we do the summer help? We couldn't do that with the snow removal. Uh, do you mean like? Like hiring DPW supplemental staff. Oh, right? so the biggest issue is uh, the capital outlay for the equipment. Our biggest concern, so it's not that that's not a possible thing for us to do in the future, it's that um, before we make that kind of capital outlay, we should decide that the city wants to be doing sidewalk snow removal, and we should have a longer term funding model available for how we will do that. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly a thing that we can consider doing in the future. Um, for the pilot program, it would have committed the city to doing this for the long term, I think, before we all had an opportunity to see and understand whether or not this is something we want to be doing. Do, do we know, or, <clears throat> or do, do you have an idea of number-wise what the equipment was going to end up costing us. Jeremy did do uh, an analysis. I do not have it on hand, but it was you know it was six figures. Yeah, okay. Because that was that was my understanding that we didn't go through that because it was so yes. restrictive. Yes. Yep. We did do an, an analysis. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, do did you, you have, have a number? Yeah, it was ballpark numbers. Are I think okay, it was so. one hundred thirty thousand. I believe it was for two. Two pieces of equipment that we would need it. So I think about sixty-five grand a piece. If I'm mistaken, Greg. I think that's correct. Yeah, one hundred thirty thousand, I believe, sixty-five thousand piece. And then how many how many new employees would we end up having to hire? Jeremy, the seasonal hiring. Yeah. I mean, again, I know this is sort of you know a little vague because we don't know because we've never done it before. Right. But, but we did we do an estimate. It would. It, we're do. it would. It would probably be up to six to eight okay. people. And if you do that, you know, we're talking about benefits because we're going to need to, yeah. Yeah. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I, okay. Anything else? Now, one quick question, though, Jeremy. You said benefits. Do our summer help people get benefits? Uh, some do, some don't. It depends. Our sanitation workers uh, part-time don't because they only work, I think, less than 20, I think it's 29 hours. Uh, but obviously if we're doing sidewalk uh, snow removal we would need more for three months yes and if you work more than 29 hours you gotta if i'm not mistaken i don't know if anybody is that right more than 29 hours in a week you would need benefits it doesn't i don't think it matters about the months it's just how many hours you work a week what we needed the executive session? What? No, what? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. No, actually, to the I'm contrary, sorry. madam, I, I wanted to just take this is Greg Lowe with the administration, sensitive to your question about what is and is not covered in executive session. I just want to address directly the question you asked was regarding the impact of not using salt um, as as we proceed, which your question was around effectiveness and uh, whether or not that would potentially impact the city's liability. If I understood your question correctly and I do think we can answer that question to make sure we point out to you as counselors that uh, while the city will and a supplemental uh, responsibility uh, clear uh, the snow from the sidewalks the homeowner maintains responsibility for snow removal and condition of the sidewalk and that would extend to an ice condition that would develop as exists today so our our point of view on your question, having had a chance to consult with Corporation Council on that and having fully understood your question, is that while we won't use salt, the homeowner will maintain the responsibility to prevent ice conditions on their sidewalks. And so uh, our feeling about proceeding without salt for the pilot is that's an acceptable approach at this stage. So the homeowner would be liable. The homeowner is responsible now. I understand yes. that, but if we yes. go through and we slick up the sidewalks, and I'm out of town, mm -hmm. that's my responsibility now. 
um, at the I, I, uh, without being uh, in any way argumentative, I, I don't think we would slick up the sidewalks. I think we would improve the condition, and I'm allowing the that because right. I know where I live. Mm -hmm. They went out today. The they shoveled off the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and even with the salt, it's slippery. Mm -hmm. So without the salt, what do you think is going to happen? I would contend that the condition of the sidewalk generally would be improved and safer than it would without anything, um, without any treatment at all. Okay. So the general understanding, if I have this correct, is that the liability currently remains with the, it, at the moment it's with the homeowner, and were we to add this supplemental pilot program, the liability would remain with the homeowner for the quality of the sidewalk, yes? I think that the answer to that is yes. Did we say property owner? What did I say? Homeowner. Property, property owner. Property owner. Because it's property businesses owner. as well. Yes, yes. Thank we, you. It would be, be the whoever, owner, whoever owns the property, not the renter. Exactly. Yeah. So the property owner. Gotcha. So do we have information here of what the charge would be per deployment? The information is not in your packet. It has been discussed, although until the council approves me a final contract, it's not absolutely set. But the total amount would still not to be exceed one hundred and seventy thousand. But what I mean, what would that depend on? Yeah. Depend on the estimate number of deployments and the cost of doing service. Because I mean, I think one of the things we get a lot of comments from constituents is whether or not this is a good deal, whether or not we could do it cheaper in house, whether or not it would make sense. So for me, I think for us to be able to evaluate it, you'd want to say, okay, well, there's a snowstorm of four inches. What is the city going to pay mm -hmm. to clear that? And I think that's an important thing to be transparent about so that you can, we can go to constituents and say, yeah, it's a good deal because if we tried to do in-house, it'd be double or triple or whatever it would be. Yeah. Um, so to me, that's something we would want information on. Sure. So we can uh, make sure that you guys get that information um, as quickly as possible. I do think in terms of the cost effectiveness of doing it ourselves versus having um, versus this you're paying for deployments, uh, this will be more cost effective as for us um, based solely just on the capital outlays that it would require. Right, but I, I guess to my, to my idea is for us to vote on it soon, like we don't know, is it 6,000, is it 25,000? Right. We need to know that before we would vote on it, I think. Interesting. Yep, understood. We'll get you that information as quickly as possible. So, so the first contract that we uh, accepted in, uh, or the first proposal in, in proposal, um, what, what, were, what went wrong with that and why are we not to assume that there be the same problems with this one? So in our first request uh, to you is to come to an agreement in, in principle. I think we've we made significant progress with um, this group before coming to, to you guys to ask for that ability to, to negotiate the contract. Um, I think some of the biggest issues were frankly, um, you know, the scale and size of this company is much larger um, and they are more, they are better positioned to take on this kind of work. And I think that that's the, the biggest difference between the two, two, two contracts. Um, so I guess our, my question would be, if when the council or if the council were to approve this, what are the next steps administratively that you guys would need to do to finalize it? And then what are the next steps that they would need to do to have their, their manpower, their equipment ready to go? And do we have a clear understanding of that and an action plan so that we're not approving something, a snowstorm comes on February 2nd and chaos ensues? Sure. So um, our understanding, uh, you know, of the next steps, if the council approves this and authorizes us to enter into a contract, we would take um, action to contract based on the agreement and principle that we have. We should be able to execute that um, pretty quickly. Um, that would allow the contractor to move forward with uh, capital equipment purchases um, and keep us in line with the agreement of. Uh, the program moving forward on or before February 1st based on that equipment availability. Um, and then, you know, the goal for us would be then to just continue to provide you with updates regularly to understand, um, to make sure that you understand how every step of that set of negotiations and discussions is, is going. Um, but, you know, we are to the point where if, you know, if we look through the, the detailed information that you have, 
the, the terms of the contract are, are pretty firm, um, and I think we all agree in principle with what we want to do, to the point where the contractor has provided us with the bonded money and has also um, gone through to make sure that the equipment is available and freed up capital to make that, that cost outlay. So I think they're very serious about moving this forward um, in a, an expedited and professional manner. So, but do you have a sense from them of like specifically what equipment they'd be purchasing, how many employees they'd be hiring? And we do. How do yep. Yeah. So we have an inventory of equipment that we can share with you, including pictures um, from their supplier. And we also know that they're planning to hire two additional staff, uh, which again, we are working with them to facilitate uh, resumes from um, available em you know, employment within the city. So is two enough? Um, they do believe that two is enough with the staff that they currently have, yes. I mean, like so being a person who doesn't run a sidewalk snow removal business, I can't answer those questions for you specifically, but I don't think that they're saying that only two people are going to be deployed on this. I think that they feel with their existing staffing mix, adding two to that will allow them to do this work successfully. Um, and again, we can make sure that they, that if you have a question specifically for them on staffing, that they can answer that. I mean, so to me, it would sound like it makes sense if there's existing bandwidth that they have that, you know, they have more employees in the need right now and they're able to use them. And I don't know them, right? But if it's today and they can't make it to the meeting because they're still recovering, like that concerns me that they're gonna hire two people to do 40 miles. Yeah, and I would say, um just in general, I mean, I think we had a significant snow event this yep. weekend. So I'd, I, I wouldn't, I would not characterize um that I have any knowledge that they have existing resources that have additional bandwidth, I would only say that um, they are a very reputable company that does this work very successfully for other people. Um, I think that they, uh, I trust that they know how to run their business effectively, but I do recognize that um, for all of us, uh, we get strapped in surge uh, you know, activity when there's a lot of snow and there are a lot of, uh, you know. So I think that this is a unique circumstance. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, uh, say that it's indicative of them not having the capacity that they need. I think it's just a unique circumstance. Yeah, because I mean, I think for me, there's different ranges of outcomes. The best outcome is we do this, it provides a supplemental service, it increases walkability, it's, you know, particularly helpful to people that, you know, don't own a car or are elderly or, you know, and it's a service that I think is needed. And I think the worst case scenario is we approve this, it's a company that doesn't have the bandwidth to do it people then, their takeaway from this is, you shouldn't try this in the future because we tried it and it didn't work. And that's the outcome I'm most concerned about and want to make sure we're avoiding. So, you know, that's just the only word of caution I'm saying. Counselor, real quick to that. So uh, I've spent a significant amount of time dealing with JSK. Um, I'm very confident in their ability uh, to handle this business. They have said they're going to need to hire additional staff, so they understand that, um, which is part of the reason uh, that it's on or before February 1st you know, they will need to manage their equipment and their staff. Um, but they have uh, shown that they are ready and able to do this work. Um, they have years of experience. They have strong recommendations. Uh, they're very reputable. So when they say that they are prepared and ready to do it, I'm confident that they are. The contract also will include performance reviews um, f during the first five deployments so that the city can make sure that they are meeting their obligation under the contract. Ultimately, we are going to pay them to provide this service. They are going to have to manage their workforce and their equipment. The expectation is if they want to get paid, they will provide the service effectively. And we have reviews built in to make sure that's happening. And will those reviews be readily available for the council or the public? I mean, you know, or, or is it just simply they're going to, you know, you guys are going to have the reviews and come back and tell us, oh, yeah, everything's fine. No, we can ensure that the information is publicly available, and we can also talk with you guys about what you would like to see discussed um, as a part of those reviews. I mean, imagine we will be managing towards the performance metrics that are outlined in the contract, um, and so if we all agree that that is a comfortable way to manage the performance, um, that's what we will focus on, and we will be transparent in sharing that with you. Do we have a copy of the contract? Uh, you have an overview of the scope of services. So it's the, it's the agreed upon work to be done. Okay. With, with the explanation, as is, is, was just said, that within five times uh, they're going to come back and, and uh, be evaluated? That's in, the, that's in this? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. It's, it says that there will be a yeah, yeah, I, review. Well, we just got it. I didn't have I a ch chance to read it. So, yeah. Yes. So my, my, my last question probably is um, 
you know so is there anything you know we not seeing a contract from the other one very truthfully um, but I voted for it you know is, is there anything different in this uh, contract um, including insurance or anything else that might be you know different than what we normally do for contracts with the city Yes, so the major difference is, and I'm just trying to go back to my notes. Right. Um, the major difference is, uh, in terms of the scope of services, we, as we discussed, are the SALT, uh, the deployment model being um, two inches versus, so three inches uh, versus, uh, regardless of just constant precipitation, so that has changed. And... I think those are the two major differences outside of, I, I think there are some additional things that would need to go to executive session. Those are probably the ones I wanna hear about. Yeah. 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 Um, in a situation like the storm we recently had, at what point would you s deploy? So if it snows for two feet of snow over the course of 24 hours, at what point would you deploy and would you have to, I know I was really annoyed when my wife made me shovel every two hours when I just wanted to wait until the snow finished. Um, would that be the policy? Would you send them out as, as a few inches fell and then send them out again after a few more inches fell or would we wait until the full two feet fell and then we'd deal with it from there? So under the scope of service that you have, um, there's a system at three inches uh, on the ground accumulation, the contractor would have the right to deploy with the approval of the city. The city could veto that deployment and hold off up until six inches. At the point where six inches of snow is on the ground, the, the, uh, the contractor could let us know we're deploying and they could go and deploy. Um, the purpose of that is a compromise. Um, if, we, in, if we had ultimate veto power, we could wait until there are two feet of snow on the ground and they would only go out once. Um, that would obviously make the job significantly more difficult, but under a per deployment payment system, they would only get paid the same amount. Um, so that's a system that was negotiated and agreed to on a per deployment place basis. In, and in part of this uh, distinguish or differentiate differentiation between three inches or six inches instead of waiting for a full two feet of snow is that there's a significant uh, increase in the amount of work especially when it comes down to the type of equipment that you're using to move two feet of heavy wet lake effect snow as opposed to three inches that was my wife's argument as well <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna be. I, I'm gonna go back to what you know, Councilor Green had you know said earlier. I, again, I, I, I'm completely comfortable with being the jerk on the council. I really do sort of have a concern about what we're doing with this and how much it's going to cost per time. And then if we're going to have to, if if February is an ugly month and we get a ton of snow, are you guys are we going to have to come back and say, geez, we need you know more money? Um, because how much is it going to cost us per time mm -hmm. to do this work? Because, look, at, I think everyone on the council, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think the majority of the folks on the council want to see this go through. I think this is a good thing, and we got to at least try it. But it, it comes down to we blindly went with you the last time and trusted that the last contract was going to be fine and go through, and then whatever happened fell through, and now we've got a new company that's supposed to be you know, great as well. And you know, I think we thought the last one was going to work with us, and you know, whatever happened happened, and that fell through. Uh, I just don't want to see this happen again because I think a lot of us are getting calls from constituents that are basically saying, well, this isn't going to work, and they're discouraged and, you know, I don't want to say pressuring us not to do this, but, you know, we're, we're catching a lot of sure. flack for it, and we don't want to see people get discouraged. I think this is something that the city can do. Um, I, I just I get a little concerned when we sit here and say, well, we'll get it to you after we vote on it. And I get the sure. time crunch, but yeah, and so we can we, we can ensure that you have that information um, at, before yeah. a vote happens. Um, I do to to your point, and to all of your points, Councillor. I, I understand, you know, and I am sure that people are calling you. I have I'm a hard sure time walking down the street yeah. without no. having, but I, you know, I think my biggest, um, you know, I think all of our biggest gratitude is your continued partnership and willingness to work with us on this. I think we all recognize that this is a community challenge, that it's a public safety issue. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, this has been really hard. Like, it's been very, challenges that we haven't expected um, have come into play. I think it's been difficult for us to um, figure them out, but I do think we, you know, 
we have been working through it. We've been um, doing it in, in good faith. We, I think we have a, we're in a place where we have a very reputable contractor who has capacity. And I think that that was one of the things that we were truly missing before. Um, uh, but I do appreciate that. I, you know, and I want to do something that instills confidence in the importance of this moving forward as well. Yeah, and, and please don't take that as, a, I, I understand and appreciate how difficult this is. Look, and I, I don't envy you for the work that, you know, you and the rest of the administration have to done to, you know, get to even where we are now. But it just, it, it, it's, uh, to ask us to continue to vote on things when we're being told we'll get the information after the yeah, vote and is, is difficult to do. And I, I just, do, we do have the information. Sure, no, I understand. We do have the information. I think I was concerned about giving it publicly, not knowing if it was a proprietary component of their contract. But I do think council is comfortable with us giving that information. So I don't know if you want to. Sure. So under the agreement and principle that we have with JSK, they would be paid um, $5,000 per deployment. So the first 10 deployments would be 6,000. Okay. That is to cover um, the difficulty in doing a new service. So they understand that uh, during the first number of deployments, they will probably have to have trucks drive behind the uh, tractors, making sure that they understand the routes, clearing the access. Um, so it will be 6,000 per deployment for the first 10, 5,000 for every deployment after that. Um, and again, I don't know if this is an executive session, but to Councillor Carney's point about constituents, so throughout throughout the last, um, you know, my first year on council, a lot of times you have people who are on fixed incomes, elderly folks, and uh, I, my two big concerns in this issue were one, the liability question, which council just answered about the liability if someone were to slip the the. The liability line with the property owner. My other concern is um, if if the driving plow should happen to damage a sidewalk while it's doing its plow, um, the property owner would still be on the hook for it. So, for me, if 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 we have the liability issue of the plow is going down, it hits a sidewalk, and then we have to redo all the sidewalks, I'll have constituents, you know quite upset that they now have the burden of, of fixing it. We, we spoke to the downtown committee and they said that's that's not something that they have a frequent problem with. They deploy a similar program. So my concern is is just would be to that about uh, whether the burden lies with the property owner. I just wouldn't want constituents calling me saying I used to plow my own sidewalks then you guys took over and now my sidewalk is damaged and I have to pay for it, which is the type of calls we get most frequently. Mm -hmm. but. The way I relate it is a lot more polite than my constituents relate. Contractually, we'll be shifting liability to the contractor for any property damage caused by their action. And when I spoke to uh, Commissioner Lowe before, uh, Director Lowe, uh, we talked about doing a full survey of the 20 miles. Is that still in place? Do we still have a plan to do that? So part of this process does include evaluating where we have poor sidewalks. And a, and a good point of this is that um, under normal operation, this would not damage a sidewalk that's in good condition. If a sidewalk is hazardous currently, um, that is where we may see some issues. But if a sidewalk is currently hazardous, that means that it's currently not in compliance, and, and that's a separate issue. But part of this, working with our contractor, it's going to be a work in progress, but we are building out that comprehensive list of what is wrong with the sidewalks and where exactly is it and what is the remedy. Is it a full flag replacement? Can we do things that are easier for the property owner? That's all part of this and that's <clears throat> um, part of the reason that this is falling obviously under DPW, but also why we're working with the sidewalk inspector specifically as uh, the program manager because he has the most uh, in-depth information and involvement in this entire process. Okay. So going back to President Hudson's question earlier about liability, I can understand certainly the need to not talk about specific things that might come up as a result that would potentially encourage lawsuits. But we know a similar program is in place in Rochester. So you know, as a general record, have they seen more suits of liability and what has been the outcome of that as a result of their supplemental program at a high level? So I think that the, at least as far as I understand it, the biggest, um, I think that there are differences in 
ownership of yeah. sidewalks. And so I don't, I, it don't, I think it's kind of apples to oranges. Yeah, that's correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. Rochester has taken over ownership completely. So they repair it and, as well as clear For it. Decades. So it's, yeah. yeah. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a different yeah. liability. I mean, yeah. we're sort of going into kind of a gray area. We which, are. Which is what my concern sort of is with the policy and all, the, all that, because it's really. Yep, it's part. It's it it's what makes this very complex, yeah, yeah. frankly. Okay. Yep. City Clerk Panis, want to chime in? I just want to point out something that the city has maintained. I used to be the deputy commissioner of public works in the '80s, and the city has maintained the sidewalks are the owner's responsibility, even though they're in the public right of way. We have never done anything on sidewalks unless we had agreement. In the case of a downtown committee, they have agreement with the property owners to clear the sidewalks, which we don't have in this particular case. If you were to go on and do work on a sidewalk, I would believe the city would be in the liability chain. For example, I used to go to court and testify that we were never notified of a defect on a sidewalk and the city was removed from the lawsuit because we didn't fix a defect we weren't notified of. But if we go in and create a defect or create a situation, if the, the person wants to sue I would think the city would be in the chain of liability because we went on that property not only did we not have an agreement but we went on the property and cleaned it and whether the property owner is ultimately responsible we would also be in the lawsuit in my opinion can I ask one more talk question? about an executive session yeah <laughs> um, one more question we're talking like we're going to be deploying all the city sidewalks what's the scope What's the scope of the sidewalks? Uh, it's there's 20 a, miles of sidewalks, and they are 20 and 40. I know that, but it's around what perimeters? Oh, um, there's a map. It's outlined. Yes. I can't see that. Too <laughs> there's a map on the second to last page quadrant. I can't see that. So these routes were uh, developed with a couple of different criteria, and we tapped the SMTC, Syracuse Metropolitan Transportation Committee. Um, to help us with that and so what we started w with was principal arterials the busiest roads um, with the highest classification so those are places like route 11 south salina street or um, james street or route 5 uh, genesee street so places where we know we have very high volumes of traffic but also places where we know we have very high volumes of pedestrian as well and that's due to generators that are quite apparent like schools it might be um, other amenities retail areas right so we're putting those together and stretching them out from the downtown network to create a base level of service that is consistent of four different quadrants a number of routes that gives you again just a base level of usable walkable areas in the winter months because everybody's talking like we're just going to be going to neighborhoods clearing sidewalks that's not the truth no. No. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to bring that point up. Council Doherty. Thanks. I appreciate you. Just give me a minute. You know, I think what Greg mentioned was one of my points, I think, is why I sort of insisted on saying property owner instead of homeowner. I think that the idea that people are still responsible up to that three inch threshold. Uh, I think that needs to be publicized. I think that people know that. And I think the idea of the accumulation is, is a good addition as opposed to the just the threshold. The other point I wanted to make, though, is that how bad business owners are, and that's part of what I'm saying about properties, at clearing the sidewalks. I think that you will be doing them a favor in those 20 miles, but I think it's got to be clear to business owners in the rest of the city, particularly the chains, uh, the corner stores, that it's their responsibility, too. Uh, just driving down Salina Street on my way here, just it's it's a joke. How many of those business owners have not cleared their sidewalks? Uh, I think they must not think people walk to I their must stores. See what's on Salina when you're going down this business? Yeah. So I mean, and I imagine Salina will be one of those streets, you know, that that is definitely going to be done. But there's going to be a lot that aren't, and I just think it's 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 really criminal uh, for a business owner uh, not to clear their sidewalks. I think it actually should be something maybe you guys take a look at. Uh, is part of the uh, of codes zoning whatever you want to do uh, I can tell you how to you know put forth an ordinance that will lose but you might want to figure out one that'll win so thanks a lot other questions no I think just let's go to executive session because we have executive good. session still so that correct? do you think we should do it now or wait till after study session 
if you want to get the most counselors, you better you yeah. Wait. We'll we'll do it after our study session so the other counselors are here. Um, anyone else want to say anything? Any comments? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you.